Good morning. My thanks again to Josh Welko and the library staff for helping me to record this discussion. Today I'm going to begin our time together by having a brief discussion of ritual purity, uh, also called clean slash unclean. Um, the, um, a matter that we Western Christians today understand with some great difficulty. The origins of what we call ritual or ceremonial purity are to be found in the Pharisaic interpretations of the book of Leviticus. The book of Leviticus lays down a number of rules, as you probably already know, that pertain to priests, and particularly uh, rules that would apply to the priest's uh, ritual purity, uh, by which they would thus be qualified to officiate at the sacred altar in Jerusalem and perform other priestly duties. The Pharisees, as they remember, the Pharisees are a group of laypersons. They are not in the main, quote unquote, ordained. Very few Pharisees, for example, would have been in priestly descent. Um, the priests are, are, excuse me, the Pharisees are in this class of laypersons, but they read the book of, of Leviticus and they decide that if it is a good thing for these Levitical rules of ceremonial purity to apply to priests, it would also be a good thing if all these rules of ceremonial purity, or clean, unclean, if you will, were applied to every Israelite. So the Pharisees took it upon themselves to go the extra mile and to live according to the Levitical purity laid down, according to the holiness code there in Leviticus, and to apply the rules of clean and clean, or ceremonial, or ritual purity, call it what you will, to themselves. Um, constitutive to the core uh, identity of Pharisees was their commitment to apply these laws and rules that the Old Testament applies only to priests, uh, to them as, as Pharisees, i.e. as laymen. In part, the Pharisees thus emphasize the Torah as they do uh, in order that they might be ritually clean. Now, at this point, we need to erase from our minds any notion uh, that, uh, uh, that we have, that we bring to the Bible at this point, of what the word clean would denote to us. Ritual purity, hear me carefully here, ritual purity is not something that you can restore simply by the application of detergent. It's not something that Tide is going to take care of. Uh, the, the category of clean, unclean in ancient Judaism is a cultic, ritual, ceremonial kind of thing. The Pharisees would have considered all society, to generally speaking, to have been unclean. Moreover, they thought that uncleanness was contagious and could be passed from person to person by contact or sometimes simply by proximity, by being in the same room. Uh, in certain respects, the, the concept of ritual purity um, operated in a way almost like magic. or like some women feel about their houses, or like some persons have felt at least in times past about certain ethnic groups. In extreme moments, uh, at least when pressed, most of us tend to believe that our own dirt is just a little bit cleaner than someone else's dirt. Case in point, uh, I grew up on a farm in the era immediately preceding the time when uh, hay was put up in great round bales that you see dotting uh, countryside fields in, in the summer um, nowadays. Uh, but uh, in the days of my young adulthood, we still hauled hay from square bales that would weigh from 65 to 85 pounds normally, put them on a truck or a flatbed trailer or wagon, take them to the barn, unload them in the barn, and it was dirty, hot work. I can remember many a summer day when we were putting up hay, as we called it. And the temperature would be 95 degrees, the humidity 90-some percent, uh, the perspiration dripping down from our brow into our eyes, the salt in the perspiration getting in our eyes and stinging. You'd have alfalfa leaves going down your neck, up your nostrils, in your ears, uh, washing down in your eyes by the rivulets of sweat. It was hot, dirty work. And I remember 
we always started out with the best of intention in that we would, each of us, have a, a styrofoam cup that was ours and we would drink water and have a water break after every load. On occasion, of course, as the day would go by, um, uh, cups would get knocked over, the best of would come up and blow them, um, and uh, someone would lose their cup or get a hole in it, and so we would share our cups with other family members. On certain other occasions, every now and then, one of our neighbors would be helping us. And this always created a problem, because true, true enough, you could almost predict that some of the styrofoam cups would be smashed or broken or blown away. Uh, and what do we do? We we're all thirsty. And, well, you would gulp, and you would close your eyes, and you would share your cup with your neighbor, or he would be kind enough to lend you his cup after he had partaken and you would drink after him. Uh, we always tried, if we were doing that, at least to share the cup of a relative. Again, I think the unwritten assumption was our germs are cleaner than our neighbor's germs. Well, um, maybe that hits that uh, just a little bit. Of the clean, unclean. Um, the, um, uh, not, uh, not something, again, that you can always get rid of by the additional application of more detergent. Now, um, in, in a broad sense, uh, clean unclean represented the condition that God demands of his people for contact with him, as I, in fact, have on this PowerPoint screen. And you can see how that would obviously apply to the priests, especially uh, in the book of Leviticus. Um, and so there were two kinds of impurity. By holiness, that is, to approach what be belongs to God alone, for example, the Ark of the Covenant, or sacrificial blood, and, and such like. Or uh, by contagion, which you, can, you could contract uh, impurity by contact with virtually anything uh, um, that should not exist. Uh, uh, by, by, by something that was that was seen to be impure by definition, and it was uh, it would spread contagion to you if you came in contact with it. So, for example, Jews considered um, uh, any uh, bodily discharge um, uh, to be um, uh, defiling. Contact with the corpse. Okay, for example, the woman in Mark chapter 5 in the synoptic parallels, the woman with the hemorrhage, the, the, the woman for whom something has gone dreadfully wrong in the mechanism of motherhood and her monthly flow never stops. Um, she's a bleeder. And what's more, she's contagious. And uh, which means very likely that she does not have a husband. Uh, it, had she had a husband, he might have had grounds for. Uh, for divorcing her. Um, it means that she's cut off from the rest of respectable, or the, the rest of society uh, due to her um, uh, impurity. It means that if she touches you, she transmits her uncleanness to you. So when she comes up behind Jesus and touches the hem of his garment, that is, the, in, in Jewish eyes, that's transmitting her uncleanness to him. What the woman discovers, of course, is the gospel in action, that Jesus' ability to heal is stronger than her ability to pollute. Uh, and that becomes gospel for her that day. So any bodily discharge um, could, could uh, defile. Um, and by the way, different Jewish groups had different definitions of purity and strategies for attaining and preserving it. For example, the Essenes are a case unto themselves at this point. But generally speaking, the, the things that defiled were leprosy, any bodily discharge, contact with a corpse, okay, for, well, uh, any bodily discharge, uh, um, saliva uh, would, uh, uh, would, would uh, could be defiling. The discharge of semen uh, would be eventually defiling. Uh, and, and um, and then the, the partaking of foods, especially foods that were associated in some way with idol worship, such as pigs. 
uh, would be ritually unclean uh, as well. Eating ham uh, defiled you not because it was raunchy ham, but because pagans used pigs in their worship of idols. Pigs were very prolific. Each sow produces two litters a year, fall and spring. Litters can have as many as 15, 18 piglets. Uh, even half of them survive to adulthood. By the way, they grow to adulthood in 12 months. They're able to reproduce. We're having the problem right now in the Missouri Ozarks of people wanting wild hogs to hunt, having turned hogs loose uh, in the Missouri Ozarks and the Arkansas Ozarks, and they're destroying much of our ecosystem because they're proliferating faster than what we can shoot them and eradicate. So um, for, for um, an, an ancient person uh, not aware of modern science and reproduction, a pig was a wonderful machine. It was wondrously fertile. And so many pagan religions would use pigs in, in their worship uh, in fertility rites and rituals. Um, and it was by this that they hoped to be productive themselves. And, and because uh, of the association of pigs and idolatry, uh, Jews have considered pigs unclean, impure, uh, so that they're not to be, uh, they're not to take that risk of being tied up with, with idol worship themselves. To emphasize the point again, Jews consider ceremonial purity, uh, uh, excuse me, they consider ceremonial impurity to be contagious. For example, merely entering the home of a Gentile rendered you ritually impure, even though the, the house might fairly reek with the scent of Lysol. Okay? Um, um, uh, merely entering the house in which a corpse would lay similarly polluted you, as did merely shaking hands with a person, so to speak, who had eaten pork or who had had a family member die very recently. As bodily discharges, blood, saliva, the discharge of semen, even through intercourse or through nocturnal emission, were all unclean. Hence, Jews attended to bodily functions with the left hand in order to keep their right hand clean. So, in Matthew 6.3, when Jesus says, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, uh, you can almost paraphrase that as saying, don't let your unclean hand know what your clean hand is doing. Because any bodily discharge was defiling, uh, then, uh, say, a, a runny nose would, would ritually defile you. We'd say, well, on that, there would be a hygienic com component, and indeed there would be. But the, my point that I've already made is, many times things were considered clean or unclean when, when hygiene wasn't even on the horizon. So, um, a woman in her monthly time was unclean. The term Zab, Z-A-B, denoted an unclean person with a hemorrhage of, of any kind, such as the aforementioned woman with the flow of blood in Mark 5, 21 through 24. Or in the plural, Zabim. Such persons communicated their defilement to others through touch. This explains why the woman furtively tries to touch Jesus' garment without him knowing, because she knows the rules of ritual purity. If she touches Jesus, she defiles him. Now, the Jews had constructed, as it happens, a complex system by which you could obtain purification from ritual impurity. Purification rituals contain three elements. They, they normally... Uh, contained uh, a waiting period that began when the source of pollution ceased and usually lasted one day or a week. A cleansing agent, most usually fire, blood, or water, and the offering of a sacrifice. The reason that has been advanced as to why, and this, this is in itself debated by interpreters of the parable of the Good Samaritan, but one reason that has been advanced, I think notably by Ken Bailey, for the priest and the Levite to have passed the wounded man by on the Jericho Road is they cannot tell if he is alive or dead without touching him, and especially if they touch him and he is discovered to be dead, they are ritually polluted. If he is alive, they're still polluted. 
they as priests and priest assistants, the Levites, should be uh, the first ones to know, after all, the rules of ritual purity. And they know that they will be, uh, they will suffer the embarrassment of being ushered out the east gate of the temple as ritually impure, ineligible to serve in the temple when it is their course's turn to serve, or ineligible to officiate at the temple of sacrifice. And, and not only will they suffer that embarrassment, but they will have to go through the time and the expense of going through a purification process to remove the ceremonial impurity, and, and they will thus be barred from serving. In other words, if the priest and the Levite stop to try to help the man, they are probably going to miss a paycheck. In their own respect, they're each trapped by the religious system. Um, uh, so uh, think about that. The, um, would you stop to help a hitchhiker or to help someone who's stranded by someone who looks like they're stranded and have car trouble on the side of the road? If you thought that it, it resulted, you're being mugged by the same people who perhaps, uh, or maybe it's just a plant and it's a setup and you walk into it and the people are going to jump out from the, the back seat and mug you, um, rob you. Uh, would you stop to help someone if you thought it was going to cost you embarrassment and a paycheck? You know, sometimes we need to read that story about the priest and the Levite, maybe with a little more empathy than we do. Touching a corpse, as Jesus does in Luke 7, verses 11 through 17, where he raises or resuscitates uh, the widow's son in the village of Nain, is the most defiling thing that a Jew can do according to such Jewish piety. Corpses are the most defiling um, uh, part of the kind of contact you can have above all else. It renders a person ritually impure for a week, during which time he or she could not go to synagogue or to temple, or if Passover fell that week, celebrate Passover. Pallbearers thus automatically suffered ritual defilement. Because contact with corpses was considered so ritually defiling, priests could bury only the members of their immediate family so as to keep themselves ceremonially clean, as, as clean as possible at least. And the high priest and Nazarites could not contaminate themselves uh, even in this manner, even to carry the funeral beer of their own parents. That's beer spelled B-I-E-R. Um, what we would call the casket. Uncleanness caused by contact with the corpse was removed by the application of a special ceremonial potion for which Numbers 19 gives the recipe. A red heifer that had never been put to common or profane use, for instance, had never pulled a plow, and which was unmarred by lameness, blindness, and like, was brought to the priest, taken outside of town, and slaughtered. The priest sprinkled some of his blood toward the front of the temple to dedicate the sacrifice to God. Then he burned the remains of the heifer, including the rest of its blood and manure. The priest threw a bundle of cedar wood, hyssop, and scarlet thread, all of which were symbols of life, on the burning carcass, so that all of these ingredients, holy and unholy, were reduced to ash together. When cool, they gathered the ashes up um, and, and stored them until needed to mix with water to treat ceremonial impurity. They thus made this could we even call it Jewish holy water? By mixing the ashes of this heifer, so sacrificed, with spring water and sprinkling it, sprinkling it over the defiled person or the person who had rendered, uh, been rendered ceremonially unclean, the infected room or house, if a Gentile entered your living room, as it were. Um, uh, and, and so it, this would be sprinkled all through your house um, on the outside and on the inside, by the way, as a kind of ceremonial antiseptic. In the case of the seventh day uncleanness for death, a person had to apply this mixture on themselves and on the house on the third and the seventh days of the week, under penalty of excommunication from the community. Um, uh, so uh, this has relevance for reading a couple passages in the New Testament. For example, the passage in Mark 7, uh, with its parallel with Mark and excuse me Matthew chapter 15, 
uh, where Jesus takes point of issue with uh, uh, Jewish notions of ritual purification. Um, uh, if, let me turn over to Mark chapter 7. Now when the Pharisees and some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem gathered around him, they noticed that some of his disciples were eating with defiled hands, that is, without washing them. And see, we read this and we think lava soap. And that's not what's... The, 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 uh, the minimum amount of water that you needed for uh, washing your hands before uh, eating uh, was one-fourth uh, was one the log of water, which is about enough water to fill one and a half eggshells. That's not going to be enough to get a lot of grime off the hands that are truly dirty. So it was a ceremonial thing, you understand. And when Jesus eats, as he does in Luke 11, without washing his hands, and uh, the scribes and Pharisees take him to task for this, understand that in the eyes of Jews, that would be like Jesus coming to your house for Sunday dinner and diving into the fried chicken or to the roast beef before the blessing is said. If you want a modern day analogy of that, okay? Um, but back to Mark 7, verses 1 and following. Where the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they thoroughly wash their hands, thus observing the tradition of the elders, which is what we now know, the oral law, what later becomes the vision of. Uh, and they do not eat anything from the market unless they wash it. And there are also many other traditions that they observe the washing of cups and pots and bronze kettles. So the Pharisees and the scribes ask him, why do your disciples not live according to the tradition of the elders, but eat with defiled hands? And Jesus quotes the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah prophesied rightly about you hypocrites, as it is written, this people honors me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching human precepts as doctrines. You abandon the commandment of God and hold to human tradition. And so, um, um, then Jesus proceeds in verse 14 to say something further about this matter of, of impurity. Then he called the crowd again and said to them, Listen to me, all of you, and understand there is nothing, nothing. Oh, hear how revolutionary that would have been for that crowd. There is nothing outside a person that by going in can defile, but the things that come out are what defile. Um, then when he left the crowd and entered the house, his disciples asked him about the parable. He said to them, then do you also fail to understand? Do you not see that whatever goes into a person from the outside cannot defile, since it enters not the heart but the stomach and goes out into the sewer? Thus he declared all foods clean. Thus he declared all foods kosher, in other words. And he said, it is what comes out of a person that for it is from within, from the human heart, that evil intentions come, fornication, theft, murder, adultery, avarice, wickedness, deceit, licentiousness, envy, slander, pride, folly. All these evil things come from within, and they defile the person. Or as Peter Ray Jones has said, Jesus tracks sin to its lair in the human heart. Um, uh, the uh, Jewish purification for ritual purity also comes into... Uh, play in the, in the wedding feast in Cana in John chapter 2, verses 1 through 11, where we are told, and, and we Anglo uh, Saxons, uh, we Western Europeans or Americans can, can just read right over, these were sticks of water pots containing the, uh, the uh, water for purification. It was Jewish holy water, uh, thus prepared as I shared a while ago. Uh, and these were large pots of, of water for purification purposes. Each pot, we're told, would, would contain from 20 to 30 gallons, so, so times 6, that's 120 to 180 gallons. It is this water representing the, the cultus and, and the culture of Judaism, at, at least at this point, of clean, unclean. It is this water that Jesus changes from stagnant water, who'd want to drink it even, uh, into sparkling wine. Um, and and the, the analogy that we almost always miss in the interpretation of this miracle is that um, um, the, 
the Old Testament prophesied that when the Messianic age came, it would be accompanied by an abundance of wine. Here's plenty of wine, 120 or 180 gallons of it. Um, um, and, and the writer, the, the author of the Gospel of John, means for us to make the analogy. Um, Judaism is to the way of Christ as stagnant water of purification is to sparkling wine. And, and that's the point of the story. Um, now, um, I've already been talking about some of these things. I should have paged down before now uh, about how to remove impurity. But all this is available to you on the angel. Um, uh, there are other texts that, that would call for New Testament relevance or comment. Uh, I've already mentioned the, the Good Samaritan and um, uh, the synoptic meal scenes, and for, for example, the one I guess it's in the last, the latter part of Luke chapter 11, where Jesus is at table and and uh, is eating with unwashed hands. According to Jewish scruple, it's uh, but you know, we can get the entirely wrong idea about that. Uh, with with the number of the healing miracles, Jesus heals people who are in a state of ritual impurity, uh, and they find, as the woman does, with the flow of blood. That Jesus' power to cleanse uh, is greater than their power to defile. Uh, for example, he heals lepers, uh, apparently regularly. Uh, he touches people who are unclean. Uh, the sixth beatitude would, would also um, call for comment in Matthew 5 8. Uh, um, can you imagine, if, had there been any Pharisees or people inclined toward Pharisaic theology in that crowd? as Jesus delivers the Sermon on the Mount. And he comes to Beatitude number six, blessed are the pure, and all the Pharisees and all those who are who basically buy Pharisaic theology, whether, whether they're official Pharisees or not, all the Pharisees let out a long, amen, brother, preach it, Jesus. And then they hear Jesus give the tagline, in heart, and the amens turn to, oh, oh, oh my, Houston, we have a problem here. Um, so this category of clean and unclean is at the heart of a good bit of ancient Judaism in one form or another, regardless of whether you're Essene, Pharisee, or, or even a Sadducee, because Leviticus is in their Bible after all as well. And, and the, a striking contrast is presented to us by Jesus, who consistently initiates contact with persons in his ministry, whom official Judaism would shun or keep at, at, at certainly, at, figuratively speaking, arms, uh, an arm's length distance. He touches lepers. He touches Gentiles. He does the unthinkable, and he, he, and he touches corpses. He does so from a heart of compassion. So that in Jesus' ministry, cultic ritual yields to the divine mercy. And people experience the gospel. Um, okay, well, um, we can uh, talk about clean, unclean uh, some more when um, uh, I meet with you in, in class. Uh, I did want to go back earlier in this PowerPoint. Let me back up for a moment. Um, trying to skip over my notes and say just a little bit about almsgiving as well. Uh, if I can... Uh, I'm going to hope I have enough time here to uh, complete this uh, in so that we can uh, have this material and you can be exposed to it uh, hopefully for your future profit in interpreting the Bible. Uh, almsgiving in terms of a working definition for us in the New Testament, broadly speaking, it was giving to charity. Uh, giving to the United Way, giving to um, World Hunger Relief, giving to the Salvation Army, uh, all these things, uh, writing a check out to Victory Mission in Springfield, or to Tots for Kids here at Christmas time, um, all these things would have, would have been classified under the general category of almsgiving at the time of Jesus. 
And so there, there's a strong impulse uh, toward giving to the needs of the poor and hungry in Second Temple Judaism. In fact, we find this in the Old Testament as well, or in the Hebrew Scriptures. And as I said, broadly speaking, our category for today would be charitable contributions. Um, so, um, uh, oh, uh, perhaps even in a very broad sense, um, uh, Social Security, Medicare, food stamps given to the community checks might be considered um, examples of almsgiving. So, almsgiving, uh, if, if we want a working definition, as I have here on the screen, is benevolent giving to meet the needs of the poor, the hungry, and those in some sort of financial want uh, during the New Testament era. Uh, it, this does have a strong Old Testament root to it, uh, background. It is astonishing, and I wish Dr. Bear were here to hear me say this personally, uh, but you can tell him that I said it. Evangelical Christians in the United States today are notoriously blind to all that the Old Testament says, commanding active help for the poor, the widow, and the stranger in the gate, beginning with the hungry. And our ignorance of those Old Testament texts and that Old Testament evidence reveals, in part, um, uh, our selective literalism and how and when we interpret the Bible, and it also certainly reveals that uh, pastors uh, and Sunday school lessons don't give enough time to that portion of the Christian Bible that was once the Hebrew Scripture. For example, in the Old Testament, uh, remember the story of Ruth and, and the requirement in the Pentateuch that the corners of the fields were to be left unreaped so that the poor might glean and earn their bread by the dignity of work. So also with the grain and the olive harvest. Uh, look at such, uh, well, I'm going to list a whole number of texts. Uh, these will not be on the final exam, but in case you think Dr. Furman is just making this stuff up, uh, take a look at some of these texts. Leviticus 19, verses 9 and 10. Uh, a number of passages in Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 14, verses 28 and 29. Deuteronomy 15, verses 10 and 11. Deuteronomy 24, 20. Isaiah 58, verses 7 and 10, the verses that we read in class just yesterday. Um, Ezekiel 18, 17 and following. Psalm 37, 21. And many others. Uh, the, the Tractate Pia, that's transliterated into English, P-E-A-H, in the Mishnah, deals entirely with gleaning or leaving um, some of the agricultural produce in the field or vineyard that it might be harvested uh, by uh, those in need. So, um, um, well, we've already talked about that. And I, I apologize, I, I may at some point go back and, and list those Old Testament texts so that you could look at them at, at leisure, but I hope I read them slowly enough that you could write them, some of them down. Um, there was a system uh, of almsgiving in the New Testament era, uh, fairly well worked out actually by, by the, uh, the turn of the eras. Um, there was certainly private charity where uh, individuals were encouraged to give on, a, on, a, on an individual basis to help the needs of those who lacked. But there was also something of a system of, of public charity. Um, and, and I mention this because it plays a part of the background of the early church's experience in the, in the opening chapters of the book of Acts. There was a weekly food distribution called the Kubah, K-U-B-B-A-H, uh, transliterated into English. Uh, rabbinic sources uh, stipulate that each community, each Jewish community, uh, appoint two trustworthy men to serve as collectors. They were to make the rounds of Jewish shops, homes, and so forth on each Friday to collect foodstuffs. Then a commission of, of, of three oversaw the distribution of these foods thus collected. They gave enough food for 14 meals. That would be one week. Jewish meals at the time of Jesus were two meals a day. So 14 meals would get you through one week uh, 
a person or family was not eligible if he or she or they had food enough in their cupboard, as it were, to last them a week. So uh, that was a couple, a weekly distribution. Interesting, in Acts chapter 6, uh, well, I'll come to that in just a moment, uh, but um, we'll hit there in, 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 uh, quickly enough. Then there was also the, the daily distribution of food, the Tom We, uh, transliterated into English, T A M H U I. This was collected by a committee of three for the next day's pressing needs. Someone was down to their last can of beans and they ate that for supper tonight. What are they going to do tomorrow? Um, well, um, the Tom Wee might come to their aid. Recipients were not eligible to receive this offering if they had food enough to last two days. But if, if you had nothing at all in the house, this, um, this could be your, your, your salvation, as it were, to keep you from hungry. Uh, there was a, a special room in the temple called the Chamber of the Silent. The Chamber of the Silent was a, reserve, was a room reserved where people might contribute and receive anonymously. It protected the identity of the giver and the recipient. Uh, uh, Jesus speaks, I believe, about giving your alms in secret. The Jewish idea was that both donor and recipient might be anonymous. And in Matthew 6, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus shows himself in uh, verses 1 through 4 uh, uh, to be in harmony with this Jewish ideal, although doubtlessly not everyone adhered to it. There were a number of benefits uh, that accrued to the giving of alms, some of which you might already know from our reading in the Mishnah, or excuse me, reading in the Torah, I'll get it right the third time, when you believe reading in the Apocrypha earlier this semester. Um, it is better to give alms than to lay up gold. Alms doth deliver from death. It shall purge away sin. Tobit 12, verses 8 and 9 declare. So almsgiving is almost a fire insurance of sorts. Um, it atones for sin. In, in the second temple period. And, and there were other ways of atoning for sin too, but this was certainly one of them. It was also said to, to bring material reward in the form of health. There was an ancient Jewish proverb that ran the door which is not open for charity will be open to the physician. So give alms to keep the doctor away from your door. Uh, almsgiving was thought to secure male heirs. And it was thought to bring rain. Now, in terms of its relevance for uh, the New Testament, uh, Matthew 6, 1 through 4, in the Sermon on the Mount, uh, as it stands, is a warning against ostentatious piety, piety on parade, we might say. Um, Jesus speaks to folk who apparently are more concerned about their esteem in the eyes of others than they are with their relationship with God. Note the reward for both kinds of piety. The reward does not come to those who seek it selfishly. Uh, oh, they receive the acclaim of others as their only reward. The Greek word there is apeko, which means like receipt or stamped paid in full. It's a business term that suggests that those who do such deeds for the acclaim of others receive that, but only that, and the books are closed, the accounts closed, that's the end of it. God, though, approves secret acts of benevolence precisely because they are unselfish, having the distress of others in view and not the kudos that others might give to me because I'm such a good and generous guy. Not substituting a public for a private charity kind of a business deal. You, you can offer secret charity out of, out of um, selfish motives, too. Okay. So, um, uh, certain of the the parables uh, also speak to matters of wealth and giving to those who have need. Um, although I regret to inform you that we rarely hear some of these parables that would could be so interpreted. Uh, the parable of the rich fool in Luke 12, verses 13 through 21. Um, in our day, the become is um, uh, well. I'll, I'll hold on that. 
um, the parable of the rich fool, note the title. Of course, in 21st century American culture, we don't believe there's any such thing. We don't call people who are rich fools. We say, ah, oh, shrewd operator, you want to play the game. Um, uh, and um, uh, certainly, uh, well, the parable of the rich man, Lazarus, might be interpreted along these lines, too, uh, in that the uh, rich man is heartless toward poor Lazarus in his gate. Uh, and then Matthew 25, 31 through 46, the parable of sheep and the goats. Uh, uh, almsgiving, if you will, it is very much at the heart of that story. Giving clothes to the naked, uh, giving food to the hungry, and so on. Um, and uh, Jesus says that those who fail to do those things shall be called to account for it in the day of judgment and shall be cast uh, away from the one who sits upon the um, uh, as a, a further thought uh, that I meant to have said about the uh, matter of uh, what Jesus teaches about almsgiving in the Sermon on the Mount uh, and ostentatious piety in, in some respects the game now in 2012 maybe is to prove yourself less devout than you really are at least in some quarters so the temptation uh, Maybe, I'm afraid, for some Christians when they go out into a company of uh, oh, locker room conversation to, to let go with a slang word or a, a word that it, uh, you would otherwise say, uh, I'm not going to use that kind of language, just to show that you fit in. So here I can be just as rough as you can be. Um, But, but in other ways, we still know how to sound the trumpet. Gerald Borcher, New Testament interpreter, um, has suggested that fundraisers, for example, know how to sound the trumpet. Put the donor's name on a building or a scholarship or something. Or church is building a new building. Uh, put the donor's name and bought the pulpit furniture somewhere on a little plaque, you know, uh, somewhere on a pulpit chair or something. Uh, the first deacons in Acts chapter 6 are chosen, apparently, to oversee food distribution among the widows, so something like the kuba or the tanwi, the weekly or the daily food uh, distribution. In Acts 6, verses 1 and following, now during those days, when the disciples are increasing in number, the Hellenistic Jews complained against the Hebrews, the, the Palestinian Jews, because their widows are being neglected in the daily distribution of food. So the early church has taken over a practice that was then current in Judaism. They baptized it. They recognize a good idea when they see it, and they are practicing uh, this kind of almsgiving even near the church. And the twelve called together the whole community of the disciples and said, It is not right that we should neglect the word of God in order to wait on tables. Therefore, friends, select from among yourselves seven men of good standing, full of spirit and wisdom, whom we may appoint for this task, while we, for our part, will devote ourselves to prayer and to serving the word. What they said pleased the whole community, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit, together with Philip, um, Prochius, or Prochorus, excuse me, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicolaus, a proselyte of Antioch. They had these men stand before the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. Um, we call these the first seven deacons, and note, they are set apart to wait tables, that is to oversee this regular distribution of food that apparently the early church practices. Uh, I think this is also an interesting passage, uh, given later debates we've had in you know, the last 100, 120 years about the social gospel. Some who say, oh, the social gospel is not my gospel. Well, they better take another look at what Bible they're reading, because there are social implications both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. Um, some of the very same passages I've just mentioned in the Old Testament in this discussion, and uh, certainly social implications of passages in the New Testament, such as this one, um, uh, is, I think, let's not get suckered into taking that, that false dichotomy, that false choice between the evangelistic gospel on one hand and the social gospel on the other. Let's preach a whole gospel. Let's preach a biblical gospel. Let that be our aim. Um, I think it's interesting with all that said that one of these seven men Philip by name, one of the first seven deacons set apart to wait tables 
becomes a great evangelist, in fact, is the only person in the New Testament to be referred to by the well-earned and well-deserved nickname Philip the Evangelist. Not said of Peter, not said of John, not said of Timothy, or even Paul. But it's Philip the Evangelist. And he was called originally to wait at tables. Well, well. Um, uh, and finally, with Paul, it is really, uh, let me just say briefly, is, is uh, encouraging uh, the gen predominantly Gentile churches to continue in this tradition of almsgiving when he attempts to raise this offering uh, uh, from the, from the uh, Gentile churches. They would have a, a, probably a Jewish component, a, a, a minority a component probably, um, uh, such as in Corinth, where he spends chapters 8 9 and 7 of Corinthians, passing the hat and trying to shake the Corinthians loose from their money. The, he, Paul, and Paul, in some ways, shames them. He says, the churches of, of Macedonia, meaning the Philippians and the Thessalonians, apparently, at, at, at a minimum, have given above and beyond their means. They were, they were poor churches, and they gave generously and liberally. And now Paul is encouraging the Corinthians to ante up. Uh, and as 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2 would indicate, he, he is intent on taking this offering that he's collected as a wonderful expression of Gentile Christian love for their Jewish brothers and sisters in the faith, taking this offering that is really a testament toward Christian unity to lay at the apostles' feet for the struggling saints in the Church of Jerusalem during a time of great famine, which we know hit that part of the Middle East in the mid-first century. At any rate, um, that's it for today. Uh, um, uh, almsgiving, that ritual purity. I will see you in class tomorrow, but um, thank you for your kind attention, and uh, I look forward to meeting with you in class. Bye-bye. Okay, all right. Okay, you're all finished with it? Can I just back out of this?